Okay, everybody. Hello and welcome back to the All Saints podcast. Today, I have a special guest with me, uh, my friend Kip Chellashaw, who is a missionary, church planter, pastor in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, today, we're going to be getting to know him a little bit and his family and getting to know a little bit about the work that he's been involved in in Kenya for the last few years. Kip, it is great to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, uh, for inviting me to share in a uh, few reflections on, on the work here and on our family. So thank you so much. Great opportunity. Yeah, it's, a, thank you. it's a pleasure. Uh, I was just trying to remember how long it is since we first met. It's, it must be nearly 20 years, wasn't it? I reckon so. So Oak Hill College, uh, 2005, I think it is. Yeah, that's when you rocked up eventually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. yeah, yeah. No, so that that's um. So Kip and I were at um, Oak Hill College in um, North London together. I was there from 03 to 07, and then I, I think I can remember the day that Kip arrived, uh, and it, uh, we've known each other ever since. Um, Kip, what, we'd just love to hear a little bit about yourself. Uh, about your family, and then we're going to get on to the work you're doing in Nairobi because it is a context that is very, very different from what we're used to here in All Saints in Fort Worth. And and I, there are uh, other folks occasionally who tune into this podcast and this video, and uh, it will very likely be very different from what they're accustomed to as well. So um, let's just kick off. Tell us a bit about yourself, about your background, where you were born, uh, your upbringing, how you became a Christian, that kind of thing. Great, thank you, Steve. So I'm, my yeah, name is Kip, and uh, born and brought up in Nairobi, Kenya, which is in East Africa, um, and went to school here, family mostly here. Uh, basically, at the age of about, and I can't remember exactly when, seven or eight, a family friend shared the word of Christ with me, uh, at, just outside in our veranda. Um, and I think for a seven, eight-year-old, my, my view was, goodness, if, if Christ, if this, what this man, Joshua, is, his name is, if what he's saying is true, it, it makes sense. What else can I do but to commit my life to Christ? And he prayed for me there on the step, on the veranda. Um, and then I think looking back, I'm not going to say I wasn't a believer, but it's been a series of a greater clarity. Uh, mm -hmm. At high school, especially, I had a moment of being a bit anxious. There's lots of teaching on revelation and so on uh, that made me fearful. A friend read, me, read with, with me through John's gospel, a greater clarity. Uh, and then uh, at university, at Bristol, and then um, in God's providence, being led into ministry, uh, kill and so on. Wonderful clarity as, as the years have gone mm -hmm. on in who Christ is, why he came, and um, our commitment, the, our call, the call from him to serve him with all of our being, all of our life. Uh, all so right. that's so, me. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah, so that's me. Uh, whilst I was in the UK, once I was at seminary in my last year, uh, Rachel, who's my wife now, was visiting a friend. Uh, we met. Um, um, she'd just been on a mission trip in, in some islands off Africa and come through my home church in Nairobi. I took that as a sign. Uh, uh, and, and basically, uh, and wonderfully, her family have been serving the gospel in Africa. Uh, I, uh, it's been just great to be able to have a, 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 a spouse, a wife who uh, has served in Africa and wanted to come back to serve the Lord here. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been a real blessing. We've been blessed from that union with four children, Elijah. Ezra, Susanna, and Bethany, um, and they've been a real joy, real blessing, wonderful, really, um, yeah. um, and great to have them with us, yeah. Yeah, we, we um, had the joy of getting to know your family uh, in the church context as well, and when um, I, I, some folks know who are listening to this that uh, I used to pastor a church in North London, England, uh, Emmanuel Church, and uh, you and Rachel and the kids were members there, um, and I, I, I remember I I'd known Rachel's family, at least, from before I even met you, because the church right, I'd worked right. at previously in South London, uh, Ruth Mann, Rachel's sister, had been a member there. Uh, she was married to a guy in the congregation. Uh, she'd been, uh, one of her friends was uh, leading Bible studies that I was leading as well. And it was, so I, I kind of, I know the Mann family into which she married. And uh, her parents were missionaries, is that right? That's right. So uh, David and Jane Mann missionaries first in yeah. South Africa, which is where Rachel was born. Uh, yeah. There's an African connection there. Then they went to West Africa to Gabon. And then latterly for the largest chunk, they served uh, the gospel. Uh, the dad is a doctor, but the mum was helping with Sunday school and so on in Madagascar. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you uh, born in Nairobi, educated in England. I mean, you mentioned Bristol University. Bristol, uh, for those of you who don't know, is kind of in the south uh, west of England. Um, tell us about uh, briefly about your, your your call to the ministry, how that came about, what what events led you to pursue this vocation. 
So yeah, thanks. Um, so basically what happens is I turn up at Bristol um, and um, over the course of my first year, this small brethren assembly type chat, I was increasingly, oh, this is quite small. I, I wasn't feeling, I, I really, I was settled, um, spoke with a pastor and really the reason, not a good one then, I don't think, was like the Anglican chat down the road is feels a bit more like home because it was massive. I'd come from a big church. Uh, this church that I was at was about uh, 40, 50, uh, Anglican church down the road about 800. So I was like, oh, that feels more like at home. And he gave me his blessing, and and I and the other uh, the other thing that I really loved at the Anglican Church, which I'd never had really, was order order in the services. I came from a charismaticish background, my mum especially, and just to have a service where you knew what was going on was incredible. I I I just soaked it up. I I I tell you, I was there for pretty much any and every service. I was right. like, this is. I've never, and and over the over the course of that time, helping wherever I could, serving in, in the bit of the choir, uh, helping with welcoming internationals, uh, one of the pastors said to me, "Kip, we really think uh, there's something in this for you to think about the, the ordained ministry," and I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> not 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 for me." Uh, I yeah, I, I love the I love the serving, but can you know, that's and and then this this conversation kept coming up over my time mm-hmm. at Bristol. Um, now at the end of of, of finishing uni. I wasn't able to get a job partly because of immigration issues, not being a British national. And so right. the church comes back to me and says, look, you've not been able to get a job. We've got a church we're linked with. Go and serve for a year. And after that year, you'll know whether this is for you or not. Mm-hmm. So just do one year, you'll know, you can have a taste and see what it's like. And yeah, to cut a long story short, that began the process of exploring what it is to serve right, right, right. Um, in a full, full-time full capacity, the gospel, and um, loved that year, uh, really got stuck in. Um, at the end of it, uh, began process discussion with the Anglican Church formally about yeah, ordination yeah. training, um, That's cool. which led to me coming to college. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Okay. And um, so uh, we're at college uh, in the early 2000s together. Um, Many of our contemporaries are thinking about ministry either in uh, Baptist churches or for you and me at that time, it was uh, Anglican churches. Tell us what, what path you took after seminary and how you ended up in Nairobi, because it wasn't like one hop, right? Was it? No, it, wasn't, it, wasn't. it wasn't. So you, you know what the Anglican scene was like back in, in, in the UK. Um, and it, it really became very difficult for me to find a job when I fit a, a place to serve when I finished um, seminary. Uh, one of the things that I'd become really convinced about, um, which is still a big issue today, is um, only only men as elders, uh, which became a huge issue in the Anglican Church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I wasn't able to get a job that first year from seminary. I had to work for a Christian publishing house for a year. Then I went, finally found a church that was, to use a word, kind of complementary, and served with them for five years uh, right. in the north of England, near Manchester. Um and, and over that time, just aware of, of how the big needs back at home in Kenya. Mm-hmm. Okay, we, we travel with Rachel on our holidays, come and visit family. And looking around, I'd be like, wow, Christian country, but there are so many needs. And, and wonderfully, I think Kenya, unlike what we've seen in the UK, is at a stage where Christianity is warmly received. You're not, you know, people are happy to talk about Christian things. And so we felt with all the training we received, Rachel was really eager to come and serve the gospel yeah. back in Africa. Yeah. We felt this is a thing to pursue. And so at the end of my first post in the UK, uh, we tried to come back to Kenya. That didn't quite work or um, not able to get enough support at that point, partly. And so we had to look for something else temporary. And I I, I found another post down with uh, a a colleague I'd worked with before um, on the South Coast um, and did that for two years as we now really finalize coming back to Kenya. What right. is it exactly we come and do? Um, are there partnerships we could have here that would be ecclesiologically, that we could we, we would have like some similarity um, looking for these sorts of things? Um, and uh, finally moved to Nairobi in the summer of 2017 hmm. um, right. and have been here since um, with right. a view to establishing a, a reformed, uh, deep thinking, deep theology church. Right, because that's interesting. It, it recalls, I know, a uh, number of conversations we had uh, back in, it must have been 2015 through to 2017, um, because to my astonishment and delight, um, back then you asked the church that I was pastoring, Emmanuel, um, to be your sending church. And at that time we had, I don't know, 45, maybe 50 members um, and zero spare cash. And, and I remember saying to you, um, 
something along the lines of why on earth do you want us to be your sending church we're tiny we've got no money um and we'll give what we can uh, and I, I recall that we tried to make some contribution but you knew right from the outset that we weren't going to be the church that was supporting you financially and so just just share with us i mean what why why did we why was it with us you were having those conversations um uh in connection with uh helping you coordinate and plan your your approach to ministry in africa Thanks. Um, so basically, w- what happens at Oak Hill, um, it begins really uh, before, but what happens, what kind of gets solidified at Oak Hill is um, what, what um, deep worship looks like, what, what a worship that is grounded in the scriptures, not just to say we'll have a sermon, but from beginning to the end, how, how do you anchor what a service should look like in the word of God? And it's not just I pick it up and I pick something I like and um, we'll have a sermon that is 40 minutes and, and that's it. But what, what the whole thing and, and discussions at Oak Hill with tutors um, folk like who some people might recognize, David Field and others, Gary Williams, and just having people who are confident enough that the Old Testament isn't just a filler for the Bible, but it all, it, all of it is God's word to God's people. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for a life that honors him. And, uh, you know, as I, as I read, as I discuss, I just become really excited by what I see um, I'm being shown from the work. And I think Emmanuel and you and then the elders there modeled what this looked like. I, I read it in books like The Lord's Service, but I, I, it's, it's one thing to read it. It was wonderful to be able to come and for mm-hmm. me to just every Sunday to come and just see this like, it can be done and done wonderfully. Okay, you were still you know, family, you know. like so. I was just like, I, this is great. And I, yeah. I rather than just having a church that will give you finances, which is one thing, I really wanted in in a context where here in Kenya there are so many pressures. Um, church planting is hard work. Uh, you want you want behind you people who would keep you back on the main thing. Keep going back That's to the right. word. Live faithful to the word. Uh, honor Jesus Christ. That at whatever cost that'll come to you. Um, I, I I think that that seemed more valuable. Mm-hmm. Continues to be more valuable than anything yeah. else. And so uh, that made sense. I, I I looked around the UK scene uh, and I thought what I've seen here. I love, and I think it'll really be a great help to me. And and and, and as you know, we would speak on on Zoom mm-hmm. and so on. Uh, but that 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 to me meant has meant and continues to mean so much more than just here someone who will give you uh, yeah, finances. Yeah, because it's interesting that that's actually sheds a little bit of light on the the UK scene, um, which uh, many folks over here won't be familiar with. And indeed, it may may shed some light on the broader evangelical scene. Uh, across the US that people at All Saints might not uh, fully realize that the, the idea of having a service which is um, broadly liturgical in structure, I mean, every service is liturgy. Lit- liturgy is just what you do when you worship, right? But but where there's a degree of uh, thought that goes into the structuring and shaping and selection and the form of all of the elements of the service, and where moreover that structure is not just um, taken from one or two verses in the New Testament that mention prayer and the word. It's taken from the whole Old Covenant background of um, how the covenant renewal, sacrificial worship of God's Old Covenant people is fulfilled in Christ. That is almost unheard of in British evangelical churches and quite rare over here. And so what, what we have in the UK, I mean, you know this, Kit, but just for the sake of other folks listening, um, we've got many churches where the preaching of the word is is really quite good in lots of ways and in some some contexts it's excellent but the the corporate worship is very thin so it's a sermon surrounded by a few other elements which are not bad in themselves but there's no kind of theological coherence to the whole thing and in many contexts in the UK people are even nervous about calling it worship because that yeah, exactly. sounds a bit catholic you know exactly. so so exactly. the the idea that i remember us having these conversations and um about what we were seeking to exemplify at Emmanuel and, and what people at All Saints will be familiar with. We want the whole service to be shaped around a self-conscious awareness of how God encourages people to draw near to him. And the teaching in the sermon is, of course, a vital part of that, but it's not the only part. Um, Absolutely. And Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's intriguing. It's, it's, so it'll be, it'll be interesting for us to hear, Kip. Can you describe first what the if i say the average church that's that's probably an unhelpful thing to say what what the kinds of churches are that you encounter on the ground in nairobi 
And then I want to hear from you, and we all want to hear from you, how the church that you're pastoring is different from that. So tell us first, if, if we went into a dozen um, churches in Nairobi that were at least seeking to be biblical in orientation, what would we find? What would the worship and the community life and the life of the people in the congregations be like? Wow, yeah, big question. In, in as much as the, the, the ones that are seeking, the ones that I'm familiar with that are seeking to be biblical, they tend to be fairly large, mm -hmm. okay? And very brutally, if I can be brutally honest, a lot of the worships is almost like a, a concert. Right. Okay, so they'd have like a huge band at the front, they'd have all these impressive lights, that kind of thing. Um, you, you might have like, it, it basically starts with some kind of singing for, led by the front, then, then the music picks up tempo, picks up tempo, um, really just picks up. So, and you'd be singing, you, you could in many contexts be singing for easily 40, 50 minutes, just nonstop. Uh, right. No hymns, very unlikely to have hymns. Um, very, a lot of it is very contemporary, very, yeah, very, very contemporary, if you can put it that way. Um, uh, and then it slows down and then they might be what is like, a, in, in very charismatic contexts or leaning that way, they might be like a free for all time of prayer. Mm -hmm. Call out to the Lord, they say. Call out, yeah, everyone to call out to the Lord. Call, invite him to draw near. And then you'd have offertory, then you'd have a sermon, and then benediction. Once the sermon is over, right. that's it. Right. Go. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like, I mean, I remember going to charismatic churches when I was um, in my late teens, and um, it sounds quite similar to that um, kind of approach to worship, kind of, kind of well intentioned um, in lots of ways, but um, not terribly informed terribly well informed by a, a, a broad biblical theology of worship and can you tell us something about the theological picture because i know um i, I don't want to give people the wrong impression so yeah i'm not to say anything you tell us about the actual the theological outlook and spectrum of some of those churches in nairobi yeah so that again huge question so increasingly among young people now you you would hear occasionally uh, talk of being being reformed, and they would express themselves that way. Uh, the one that I would say is probably most reformed is very, and I, and I think they would be happy with this title, very Baptistic, um, very very Baptistic. Um, um, but they would they would consciously say we're reformed, reformed Baptist is what they say. Sixteen eighty nine, I think, is that what they for that confession. So that, that those are the guys who um, there's a lot that I, I I you know I I I see and I'm like you know this is this this is good, but they are very yeah they, in the view of kids and so on is very different to how how we would. Um, they're, and they're in the minority. The majority would be um, again I I'm sure people I hope people would it would be Armenian um, and tending to be charismatic. Um, right, okay. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, um, here. In in churches um, over here with that kind of emphasis, some of the large ones, um, and I don't want to be uh, to generalize too sharply, but it's at some point a generalization is necessary. Some of the large ones have a reputation for a prosperity gospel that is actually drawing people away from Christ. Is that is that something that you've encountered, or is that just in our caricatured picture of uh, Kenya and Sub-Saharan Africa generally? So there, there is, it's, it's not as prevalent as I thought it was um, right. uh, when I came. There, there are some, and increasingly, actually, people are becoming aware of it, and uh, right. it is being criticized at the, in the, at the, at the public level, um, like exploiting people, so people giving, um, excuse me, uh, people giving money, then you, you get what they say, plant a seed and you'll get a good harvest, that kind of thing. Right, right, but right. it's not as common... Um, as I thought, and certainly not as not very common in the middle classes. Right. What you might get in the in the big churches that the middle classes might attend would be things like uh, seven habits to make you to have you a happy marriage. Right. Okay. Okay. That would be, that so would be the soft theme. prosperity gospel rather yeah, than kind of hard prosperity. Of the, yeah, right. that would be the theme of, of of a lot of the sermons. You know, uh, that that kind of thing. Um, uh, so yeah, how how to be. How to be a good, how to be just the title of, you know, how, how to impress your, you know, your boss and then make it in life. That kind of thing. Right, 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 right. Because it's interesting, you you, you find a, a lot of the, um, I don't know whether a lot, some of the uh, larger churches uh, in the West, in America and in the UK as well, um, it's as though they feel it necessary to lead with, this is how your life will be improved. Um, if you do this thing and sometimes it's really crass and the improvement is just financial 
yeah, um, yeah, yeah. sometimes it's less crass, but it's nonetheless that where, where is the focus on repentance? Where is the focus on mm, um, mm. the uh, the hard decisions that we have to make about the way we order our lives and our families. Where, where's anybody going to talk about hard work? When, it, when, when are people going to talk about sacrifice? You know, mm. apart from sacrifice to buy the preacher a larger jet, you know, th- those. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, and and so, so it, yeah, it's it's kind of disheartening um, because if you look at the actual figures for church attendance um, in many parts of the U.S., especially in the South. They're actually quite high. And then you look at the churches people are attending. And you're, uh, like, <laughs> and you're like, okay. Um, and I, my, my impression from what you've said um, now and in the past is that that's kind of the scene you've got in, in Nairobi, um, yeah. where like att- attendance rates might be quite high, but uh, there's not much kind of uh, painful discipleship going on. You know? So that, that would be us. I mean, our slogan for our church, and it's a slogan uh, people might be familiar with. If, if you, yeah, Our slogan here is all of Christ for all of life for all the world. And, and that's really intentional. We, we're doing that because Christianity, I mean, I, I, we, we've got a, and a good number of people come from the local slum here. You go walk in the slum and people have Christian names for their shops, House of Grace or something. <laughs> um, and, and they're unashamed about this, or they'd have stickers, verses on their cars, like openly, or, you know, they'd be driving terribly down the highway, but it'd be like, Jesus is my master at the back, you know? Um, so they'd have, people are not afraid to talk uh, about Christian things. I, I've been really surprised since I came back and I'm still adjusting to it. If ever I go to any function of any kind and anyone knows I'm a pastor, I will be asked to share something. And they don't mean like two minutes. They want they want something substantial. Right, right, right. And yet, and yet so you've got this happiness with Christian things, but like you just hinted at, it's not, it's not that they don't want the painful stuff. Just tell us right. that Christ is good and he'll make your life good and he'll bless you and then finish off and wrap it up. Right, right, um, right. And crucially, all of Christ, then the word is not connected to all of life. So someone will be in church on Sunday, but they'll be beating their wife on Tuesday or whatever. Right, um, right. And, and they'll be doing things that you'll be like, dude, how? And they'll be really, you know, they might be a middle class person, but they'll be horribly treating their workers horribly. And you're like, how? how is your faith? You came to church with a big guilt egg Bible on Sunday, but how is that translating to Monday mm-hmm. to Friday? Right. And so the, the slogan is intentional. We want to take the whole gospel, the whole Christ, not just the bits you like and are familiar with, um, and even the challenging bits, for all of life. We want, we want to connect the scriptures to your, your whole life. That, right. and, then, and then we think once people have grasped that, then when they share Christ with their neighbors, with their work colleagues, with yeah. their family, it's a genuine thing they're sharing. It's not, it's not a pretend. It's not the people can go, yeah, we've seen you living this Christ you've spoken about and we want to follow him. So I think um, it's an intentional ploy. It's an intentional way we want to disciple people. We want the whole word uh, affecting all of life here. And it'd be wonderful to see uh, changes over the years as yeah. people grasp that Christ is calling them to obey in every area. Um, mm. and that, so that's interesting. I think you've You've touched on a couple of things there that I'd love to probe a bit deeper. And one of the things you mentioned um, is obviously there are some significant economic disparities. Yeah. Um, and I recall way back in 2015, 2016, you had, you had a plan to plant a church basically on the border between a wealthy upper middle class enclave and a slum and to try and reach both communities. Um, can you talk to us about yeah, how that's going? And and uh, <laughs> so, so just just dis- first first up, just describe what kind of economic disparities we're talking about here, and then maybe some of the impact of that on uh, how you try and minister to people. Yeah, so uh, uh, you're right. You, you you described it as as best as I could. We are on the edge of both um, both a nice area, sort of upper middle class, upper middle class, and then five minutes, literally five minutes down from our, our house here is a slum. And yeah, the guys in, in the state we live in, you know, travel the world. Um, they would have, you know, we were, we went walking this evening and a gate opened up and my kids were like, wow, they've got four cars, you know. Um, <laughs> we, we only got the one, but, you know, Susanna noticed, look, look at that. Um, some people have swimming pools, that kind of thing. And then you go to the slum, which I, we, you know, I took the kids walking last Sunday afternoon and, mm. you know, it's, it's this tiny room, you know, everything is in one room, there's a bed in the corner, they have these small gas canisters to cook from, uh, it's dusty, uh, usually the floor is just soil and muddy, uh, hardly, hardly some would 
uh, have come to the city to make a life, but have not really traveled even around Nairobi. They don't actually know where the main sites in the city are. Because if they have a kind of job, it's backbreaking. They're there, you know, working as much as possible and they come home, conk out, that kind of thing. Um, right, right. So it's quite, yeah, really um, great, great extremes at, at that level. Um, you know, uh, something we've seen over the, the, the course of this year with COVID, to last two years, you know, a lot of the middle class guys who come to us, you know, they would have the best health cover ever, private care, that the other guys who depend on the hospital, the government hospitals are just like at the mercy of, uh, yeah. Right, I, I mean, right. They turn up to one lady, the other, they turn up from hospital, kid has been a bit well. The doctor said, we don't have any medicines, go home. Um, so it's that kind of disparity. Right, right, right. Uh, have I tried to minister? I think it's been harder work than I imagined. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> to you be have honest, a pretty vivid today, imagination, Kip, so we want to hear about <laughs> I, I, I think I, I'm like, oh, man, I really, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges are that, if I'm really honest, is that the, the upper middle class, the rich folk, just don't like hanging out with other, with people not unlike, who are different to them. That's been one of the hardest things, even believers. Um, that, that's been tough. So, and it, it things, things have come to the fore with things like COVID. So, if ever, you know, that the slum guys will not have any qualms, you know, it's the Lord's Day, they'll be here. Okay. Mm. And if there was any issue, you know, if there was someone coughing, you know, they'd still come with their kids, you know, kid is slightly coughing, but they'd be in the service. And all the middle class guys would be like, who, who just cough? You know? <laughs> uh, right, right, right. So it's been trying to manage those sorts of issues. Mm. Um, um, I think, what have I tried to do? One of the things that I think is beautiful in trying to help people uh, bond together is we try and have as much as possible food together after the service, for example. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's something about eating together that just breaks barriers that that forces yeah. people to think, you know what? Um, okay, I now have to sit and talk to the person next to me. Yeah, um, yeah. And there've been some wonderful connections that have happened there, uh, not with everyone by all means, but with quite a few people. And 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 I'd love to see more of that uh, happen over the years. Right now, we're not we don't have a venue, so we're meeting in our home. Once we have things like a venue, it'd be good to have things like proper meals, full on meals together um that that because now we have kind of light light snacks and i encourage people to just hang around but to be able to actually sit down properly would be a wonderful way i think people will have to engage right. with each other right. so that kind of thing. yeah i like that i like that um and so uh you've you've hinted at the, some of the demographic of your church and i i recall you sending an email a few months ago um and it just totally blew me away looking at the figures um yes. just give us a sense of how and you're laughing now i mean i mean how how is your church grown in the last few months and and with whom has it grown just give us some numbers so we have an idea of that first lord's day if you, yeah really first gathering in, in one sense uh, back in advent 2020 first uh, sunday of advent november end of november and we were 29 uh 29 30 um and um it was half and half 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 meaning half from people from the slum half uh, mid class folk um Really, to be honest, the, the biggest growth has been from the slum folks. So by June, um, we've had an interesting year with, in Kenya. I don't know what it's been like precisely where you are, but with, with COVID, we've had start stop because government has asked churches to not gather. Um, and in, uh, but by the time we got to June, when there was another COVID outbreak here, we were clocking about a hundred and yeah, over one hundred and ten, with about eighty of those being children, children from the slums. Right, so I'm just doing some maths here. You've you've gone from about 30 to 110 in seven months. Yeah. And the growth has come not quite entirely, but almost entirely from uh, children from the slum areas. Yeah, so so basically they, this would be folk under what would we we're looking at 15 and under. Yeah. So right. so in, wow. in in June, which was uh, our highest, June, July, highest attendance, yeah, we're over on, on between 110, 120, and right. we'd be getting easily 80, 80, 85 kids. Yeah. All those would be under 15. And and to, just to just put some of the dates back on the timeline, not to be diverted by this, but you mentioned 2020. Um, I People might be wondering what you're doing between 2017 and 2020. You, yeah, you spent so a number of years working with other churches, right, just to exactly. establish connections. I, 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 I spent time with, we spent time principally, well, with other churches, true, it was actually three, mm, yeah. but, but one main one, which yeah. we, we found in our local area, and they were very small, and they said to us, hey, uh, we'd love it if you stick around, help us to grow. We, 
um, you're young, you've got a young family, you, you seem uh, energetic, stick around, help us grow, and then we might plant, we might help you plant together. Yeah, um, yeah. When, we, when we joined them as well, they were about 30. By the time, by, by the time we left is not quite the right word, because basically COVID hit in 2020, that church closed, and very unfortunately, it has not opened again. No physical right. in-person right. meeting. But by the time that point came, we were probably clocking about 100 um, right, okay. of, our time, okay. of our time being there. Um, so, okay. so, so yeah, so we, 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 and part of that was an intentional strategy. We wanted, I feel, I felt that, first of all, there's Rachel who, yes, yeah, she'd served in different parts of Africa, but to help my family get to feel they've settled in Kenya, just to know how people think, what is expected of people. And then for myself, get, get myself back into the Nairobi scene and what, what is yeah. going on here? What, what, what are, what are the theological kind of impulses? Where, where are people at? Um, and so um, we, we served with this church, Koinonia Fellowship, it was called, uh, with, with a few to doing that. Um, so, yeah, for those, for those uh, since 2017 to last, to 2020. And, uh, and the church, I didn't even ask you to tell us the name. Uh, the church that began in 2020, the name of that is? The name is Christ Church Loresho. Loresho. Loresho with an L. L-O-R-E-S-H-O. Yeah, yeah L-O-R-E-S. H-O, Right, okay, so people can find that online. Um, awesome, okay. so I, I want to just finish up with a couple of questions. So um, uh, you've talked about the demographic of this church, which is going to be unlike anything that almost anyone listening to this video or podcast will have ever encountered. So it will be great to hear about what kind of discipleship issues are you running into? What, what happens when you plant a church with that ends up with upwards of 80 highly impoverished under 15 year olds what kind of discipleship issues are you running into uh, along with all the adults and so on and then love to hear about that I mean, that'll, that'll move into the next thing i wanted to ask about challenges for the future and opportunities but talk to us about the kind of discipleship uh, and teaching that you're needing to provide for these young people again man i i i really out of my depth in one sense like so, so let me give you... Yeah, aren't we all, brother? Uh, aren't we all? <laughs> so, 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 yeah, by the way. Uh, so um, basically, in, in, these, in, in the slum context, because of the messiness of life, you encounter things that no one really prepares for you, like abuse, okay? Uh, and we, even in the West, it's become a kind of um, vogue thing to talk about in, in some ways. But, you know, kids, kids would turn up on Sunday morning, and Rachel, especially, who's doing quite a bit of teaching for, for the children, helping with that, you know, you just see kids who are disheveled. Um, we had one of our young men go visiting, um, found, found a kid, Moses, who was on his own. Mum had, we don't, it's kind of hard to work out, got gone to look for work. And he'd been left home for like three days on his own. Okay. Oh, um, see. He'd, he'd be like 14. Right. Just fending for and himself in the slum. Fending for himself. The, 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 this guy had gone, he'd gone to one family uh, and I'd asked him to go because there'd been an issue. Go and visit. Just check how the, this young man is. This this other young man, a young man had been abused in a certain way. I said, go and check on them. He, he goes there. The mom is so happy that this guy's come. He's given he's given some fruits. He goes to see this other guy, Moses. As he's just going, passes by, finds this guy's been on his own. Uh, the house is leaking. He's not eaten for two days. And basically, he's, the, the gift he'd been given by this other family, he decides just to give to this person. And right. I wrote to him in the message, you know, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Because yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, so that's, that's one issue. And, and, and where the pressure point for us is, nearly every Sunday, I finish, we finish the service, we're having this snacks and chatting, then we have a Bible study, um, uh, you know, a bit of picking up on the sermon, or, or, or we've been working recently through the Apostles' Creed. Um, but Almost every Sunday I talk with people and you just talk for 10 minutes. There's an issue, usually an issue that requires some material involvement. And right. I, I, sometimes you just find like, I'm, I be, I'm at my like fumes at the fume level in terms of emotional giving. I'm like, what do right. I do here? You know, here's another big issue. You know, mom is sick. Uh, they don't have school fees. They don't have enough food. And you're like, where do I begin? You know, right. every, almost every week there's some kind of issue like this. Hmm. So that's one issue we face. Uh, another thing um, is amongst the slums, especially, is there's a very high percentage of single mothers. Right, right, right. right. So it's like wow, right. Uh, and and Rachel's been meeting with one of the ladies, and she she she's they've been reading through Ephesians, clearly aware that what's happened is a sin, wanting to do the right thing now. But her life is going to be pretty tough going forward. 
Um, right, right, right. Really, just just so so very difficult. And you look and you're like, oh, how? And then and then we've got we, we you get people who come. You you try and tell you know try and help them to say like this is not a good place and this is not a good way. Then they seem to acknowledge it. But then so, we I can think of one lady disappears, comes back after like ten months, and they have another child with someone different. And you're like, right. oh, I, what what right. do I say here? You know. Right. So they they've been that. Then the third thing that we face that is huge, and I've had to try and teach on bitterness, anger, dealing is is like there's a lot of violence, like a lot of physical fighting. Um, mm. I've been walking through the slum, and usually, actually, really interestingly, usually it's like women fighting. You know, they've been they had someone gossip, they go turn up, they get into an argument, they start fighting it in, in public, just like I see right. more than you're like, wow. Um, and so just trying to tell people when when people upset you, how should we deal with things? What what do you think is is the right way and like i've noticed even with the ladies here you know you think of one peter three quiet gentle spirit and they have to have a kind of aggressiveness about them that is that sometimes throws me you know you ask a question you know challenging someone back and they start answering and you can see like pent up you, yeah so it's just trying to wonder how in, in in a tough situation how do you still trust god how do you yes, uh, yeah. be, be gentle without being walked over that kind of thing Right, because I'm, I'm trying to think what in in a context, in a context where there's widespread Christian profession, yes, but you still have equally, almost equally widespread epidemic of uh, single parent families, and so what you've got there is is male irresponsibility exactly. and exactly. bordering on sexual predation, mm-hmm. um, and you've got this new generation of young men and women and. And where, but the the culture, which is supposedly Christian, the Christian culture even is so antithetic to stable biblical Christian family taking responsibility, uh, one man, one woman, you know, sort of basic elements of how society is to be ordered uh, within the church under God. You've you've got this monumental task where now the Lord has given you 80 something uh, teenagers and children. And you've you've got to somehow, by the grace of Christ, lead them to stand against that um, tsunami of uh, social dysfunction, and mm-hmm. and and embrace and live out distinctively Christian uh, patterns of life in a culture where, like, there's just so much opportunity for irresponsibility and selfishness. And Indeed, indeed. And, and that actually leads me, I know you're going to ask about challenges, but yeah, one yeah. of the things we're praying for um, is, and, and it's been sad in one sense because of the middle class families not feeling they can bond as much, but just, we, we really would love to see godly families, like deeply committed to Christ families, who could join us and serve with us. Because I, I do think there's something powerful about speaking the gospel. But that needs to be wedded to seeing the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, I think these families, these kids just need to see like what it looks like to be faithful, to have, to enjoy delight in family, to be a man who leads by sacrificing, um, you know, um, yeah. And just to have families, it's not just, you know, myself and Rachel and, and just to, to, to love and serve Christ in their midst and for them to see that. Um, I, I would love God to, to, in his grace, to just send more of those that it's not that they're just, you know, four, three, four, other, five other families who are living that that faithful walk with Christ with us, that they can go, wow, this is possible. It is beautiful. It honors mm-hmm. Christ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want I, I want to go. I want to go there because here in the slum, as, we, as, we, as you rightly say, it is just carnage everywhere. Truly it is. And right, the right, kind right. of things that you hear and kids are being exposed to Rachel meets with the ladies. And sometimes even when she finishes, she's just like, Kip, I just, we are really well and truly way in uh, over and above ourselves. And uh, we need God's grace abundantly. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I can, I can sympathize with the felt need for um, stable families to form that core of a church. Um, and I remember back in, in London at Emmanuel, like, this is going to embarrass you, I know, but you were one of those families in the short time that you were worshipping <laughs> oh, with us um, yeah, after, yeah. after seminary and before you went off to your first post. And then, and then um, uh, you and uh, Rachel and, and the kids, um, well, I don't know whether we'll have a chance to see you over here at any point, but um, 
uh, it, it, it sounds like what you really want is people to move to you. So if anybody's planning to move to Nairobi, right? <laughs> Here's a ministry you could give yourselves to. I mean, it, there's, um, there's the needs that, to hear you talk about the, the situation. I mean, uh, every church has, has needs, um, social and people within it have financial troubles. And there are, uh, there's the, the wreckage of um, uh, past mistakes and repentance that's in process. But to see what you guys have before you in, in Nairobi is, uh, it, it makes me embarrassed to talk about the challenges that we have here. And we have <laughs> challenges, but we, you guys, um, you guys are the heroes um, and well, the unsung yeah. most of the time. And to hear about what you're doing, Kip, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it, if, um, just give us again um, the name of your church, Christ Church Loresho. You've got a website. We do have a website, and we've got right. a, a Facebook page. Uh, we've got a website, so we've got both those. Um, yeah, it's not. It's not like I, I don't know whether this matters to guys at all. Says it's not like, and none of those are quite snazzy. They just, we just put up our sermons and services, <laughs> and, that's, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. quite well, simple. That, right? that, that'd be a great way for people to get to know you better. They could hear you preach. Um, and we had the privilege, I can still remember you, you preaching uh, at the manual, um, which was just fabulous. Um, uh, and the, a couple of ways. I mean, let's, let's just be, be honest. Um, it, uh, so here at, at All Saints, um, we've been coming to the end of a year in which we have um, been blessed with growth, uh, which has meant by God's grace, we've been blessed with um, uh, financial provision from people's faithful giving and tithing. Um, and we have been talking as a session about uh, how best to uh, use those gifts to serve the church. And we have a commitment here, like many churches do, to uh, if we can, we don't consider it an obligation because Scripture doesn't speak in quite those ways about churches giving. But we try to give a certain portion of our uh, of our the money we receive to ministries elsewhere. And we've been blessed and able to do that. We had some conversations as a session, and um, you've been on our mind and. Um, we will be making announcements about that to the congregation in due course. And, and um, there may well be other churches um, who are listening to this who are thinking, you know what, we, we'd love to support another ministry. Uh, where, where could we go and find somebody who is uh, like-minded theologically and who's got uh, skin in the game and guts and theological principle and giftedness. And listen, take it from me. If that's what you're asking, then Kip Chalashaw is, he's not the only faithful minister in the world, but boy, he and his family are, have, they were a huge blessing to us at Emmanuel. You've heard what um, the Lord has been beginning to do through them in Nairobi. Um, and uh, there may be also people, we, we've talked about this a little bit, haven't we, Kip, in the past? We've not mentioned it today. Um, people who are looking for opportunities to serve overseas short term or medium term. Is that something that you'd um, be able to uh, help with or anything of that kind? Is, is that even uh, a possibility? Absolutely. I think we, we would love it. Um, we would love it. I, 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 the warning I do give people um, is that it is, it is you, you, uh, the guys who, who would think of coming should be people who are very versatile and just adaptable it is not easy it is it, right. it is um and i don't i don't i don't want to cover it up it's you know mission historically or more recently sorry mission has become a really glamorous thing uh tick that box you know uh, i went to africa but uh, it is not going to be it, it is not going to be easy um and and their challenge is cultural um um and, and so on so I would like to, to invite people to consider it. Secondly, I, I like to say, especially with pastors like yourself, with the leaders of the church, um, how do I put this politely? Basically, if you're going to encourage people, I want you to send us your, your best. Um, right. Again, churches have had a, a pattern of, of sending people they call consider troublemakers or, <laughs> or, or, or people they're like, we, we want this one out of our, of our, of our, of our sites, but we want, we want guys who are really sacrificial, Christ-centered, um, willing to serve and just, give of themselves uh, right. that would be um great work it, it would aid the ministry here a lot so not mission holiday actual mission mission exactly. service that's right. it that's it okay. they'd be, well, they'd be, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you want actual experience of actually serving real people in dire need of practical help and above all of the gospel of christ then you heard it here first folks um yeah, you can find it. an actual actual missionary doing actual okay. serious costly sacrificial mission work in nairobi kenya 
Um, yeah. And what would you be thinking? Minimum for a few months or, or a year? A few or months what? would be great. A few, a few, a few months, months would be great. Ideally, if you come for a year and right. you're, you know, you have some theological training, that would be fantastic. That would be fantastic. Right. So if there's one person listening to this who's thinking, you know what, I, I have been blessed with um, uh, a family and a church that has taught me a great deal about Christ, and I, I'd love to uh, explore the possibility of mission work in the long term, or I just want to give, actually give and actually sacrifice and actually get out of my comfort zone. And maybe maybe Kip Chelashaw is um, the pastor of a church that could use a spare pair of enthusiastic and energetic hands for a, a six months or a year. Um, please don't great. go... Please don't go if you want a holiday, a vacation. Um, go if you want to work and serve. And look, Kip's still smiling. I mean, for goodness sake, he's been there five years. The thing is, the thing is, I mean, like a lot of guys come, and even guys who come short term, we we've been in Kenya for what, since 2017, and we've not even we've not done like maybe we should. We've not done much of the sites. It's just like yeah, kind of yeah. focusing. It's 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 just um, we we have had all this, but it's nothing. We're not here just like for lazing, and it, it is hard work. And I'm not going to lie to you. Right. Sir. If it, that's got to be right. that's got to be the orientation okay great thank you um so uh if you want to support the work um it, uh here's what we'll do there's um financial support uh or prayer support or person support i'm gonna uh, make sure that we get the church website address uh, and uh that will have some means of contacting uh you kip i'm um, also if you if you have no way of getting in touch with kip and you want to find out about those things, please just get in touch with me personally. You can, mm. All my contact details are at allsaintskirk.com, allsaintskirk, K-I-R-K.com. Um, and my email address is there. You can get in touch with me personally. Say, hey, I want to talk about supporting Kip Chelashaw in the Russia, Christchurch La Russia. Um, and be, rest, uh, be assured that whatever support you're uh, enthusiastic about giving uh, will be extremely well used to serve Christ and advance the gospel. Kip, brother, thank you very much for taking time uh, out of, um, I mean, it's evening for you, right? It's half past 10 at night. It is half past 10, but no, it's, uh, it's always nice uh, to talk, Steve. I, lo I love it. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Um, it's great to talk, brother. Um, uh, there's nothing, I don't know how to cap what you've just been saying, but the Lord bless you. I uh, hope you have a great Christmas. Every blessing in Christ from us at All Saints to your church. Please pass on greetings in the Lord from me and from us all. Um, and boy, do I hope that we're able to continue the relationship uh, that we've had in recent years and to, to deepen it and maybe with other churches over here in the US as well. That'd be great. That'd be all fantastic. Right. Thank you God so much. God bless you, my friend. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.